be, could welcome up anyone who wishes to be a member. When that, that's what happens when the group offers copies to the general public. And that way, the users that don't know how to program and couldn't possibly have written this change themselves get the benefit of the change once somebody else wrote it. <clears throat> Even programmers need collective control. Now, if you were so, so brilliant and fast that you could write everything you wanted but for yourself, you wouldn't need to cooperate with anyone else. But no human being is at that level. No human being could who uses computers could possibly study and master all the source code or all the programs she's using. That's more work than any one human being can do because there are thousands of them. So the only way we can fully have control over our computing is through collective control, through working together. And for that, we need Freedom 3. So Freedom 3 is also essential. <clears throat> and the four freedoms together give us democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users. Because every user is free to participate as much or as little as he wishes in society's decision about the future of that program. Which is simply the sum total of what various users and groups of users decide to do with it. By contrast, the proprietary program develops under the sole power of its owner. And functions in social terms as a yoke, an instrument of that, that owner's power over the users. So through the program, the owner subjugates the users and can then command them, exploit them, and abuse them. Ultimately, with software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program, the program controls the users. In order for the users to have control over the program, they need the four freedoms. That's why these four freedoms are the essential ones. These are the freedoms users need to effectively have control over the program and thus the their own computing, which they're doing with this program. <clears throat> freedoms zero and one give individual control to one user to, to one user uh, considered separately and freedoms two and three are necessary for collective control for any group of users that choose to work together. But if the users don't have these freedoms then they don't fully control the program which means it's the program that controls the users and the owner controls the program so through it exercises unjust power over those users. <clears throat> Thus, society has a choice to make. On one side, we have individual freedom, social solidarity, and democracy. On the other, we have <clears throat> the power of the owner over the users. And the owner can command them, exploit them, and abuse them. Society must reject proprietary software and choose free software. <clears throat> the ultimate goal of the free software movement is the liberation of cyberspace and all of its inhabitants. We invite you to escape from proprietary software and come live with us in the free world that we have built. I started the free software movement in 1983. I wanted to make it possible to use a computer in freedom. That was impossible at the time. Because the computer won't do anything without an operating system installed. And all the operating systems for modern computers in 1983 were proprietary. Uh, free software had existed in the past, but it was mostly gone mostly didn't exist for the modern computers. So if you bought a new computer, like a PC for instance, in order to make it do anything, you had to have an operating system installed, 
which was invariably proprietary, and there went your freedom. So, how can I change this? I was one man, without much money, without much fame, outside of the users of the editor Emacs. So, and few people agreed with me. So, it didn't look like we would get very far starting a classical political movement, you know, protesting in the street and sending letters to officials. There wouldn't have been enough of us. So, and besides, I had no experience doing that kind of thing. I was not a political organizer. I was an operating system developer. But, as an operating system developer, I had another path to try to achieve the same change. All I'd have to do was write another operating system. Then, as the author, I could legally make it free software. And then everybody would be able to use their computers in freedom by running my system. In other words, I had a way to rescue people from the injustice of proprietary software by doing technical work in my own field. I was aware of the injustice of proprietary software, which most people didn't recognize as an injustice. I had the skill necessary to try to rescue some of these people, and it looked like nobody was going to try if not me. That meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this work. It was my duty. It's as if you see somebody drowning, and you know how to swim, and there's no one else around, and it's not Bush, <laughs> then you have a moral duty to save this person. <laughs> well, actually, maybe that's too strong. Uh, maybe we could identify some other people about whom I shouldn't assert a moral duty to save them. People like Cheney and Obama and all the others who protect the U.S. torturers and threaten U.S. whistleblowers with execution. Uh, fortunately, though, I don't have to resolve all those questions because I don't know how to swim. However, in the situation in the real situation in my life, the work to be done was not swimming, it was writing lots of software. So, I decided to develop an operating system that would be entirely free software, without exception. Every line would be free software, that's what's necessary. Then, I decided to recruit others to help. It wasn't necessary that I be the author of all of it, uh, and with other people helping, we might get it finished sooner. And then, I decided to make it a Unix-like operating system to get the benefit, to have the benefit of the technical, uh, uh, the, the good technical qualities of Unix. Also, I decided to make the system compatible with Unix so that the many users of Unix would be able to switch very easily because they would know how to use my system as soon as they sat down at the terminal because it would be just like using Unix. Now, Unix was a proprietary operating system with various technical advantages. It was not ethical, and I couldn't use any of the code of Unix because it was proprietary. So, uh, using Unix was out of the question as a solution to the problem. However, it was attractive to get the benefit of the technical uh, qualities of Unix. And then, I gave the system a name, which was a joke. Because the name just has to be a joke. That's the hacker spirit. But in addition, I followed a tradition in my community for how you give credit when you make a program that's similar to some other program. And that is, I used a recursive acronym as the name. <clears throat> and the recursive acronym is GNU, which stands for GNU's Not Unix. So by saying that GNU's Not Unix, I was recognizing that it was partly technically inspired by Unix. That was actually a, a custom 
revolutionary way of doing it. In 1976, I wrote the first Emacs text editor, an extensible text editor. And after that, there were around 30 imitations of Emacs. And some were called such and such Emacs, which was clear but not very fine. Uh, but there was also fine for fine is not Emacs. And sign for sign is not Emacs. And Ina for Ina is not Emacs. And mince for mince is not complete Emacs. And version two of Ina was called Zwei, for Zwei was Ina initially. So you can have a lot of fun with recursive acronyms. And uh, therefore, I look for a recursive acronym for something is not Unix. But the usual four-letter approach wouldn't work because none of those combinations was a word, at least not in a language I knew. It would have to be blank I-N-U. So if that didn't work, what could I do? Well, I could make a contraction. Instead of something is not Unix, it would be something's not Unix. Blank N-U. So I tried every initial. Anu, Gnu, Knu, Dnu, Enu, Fnu, Gnu. Well, GNU is the most humor-charged word in the English language. Because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced GNU. So every time you want to write the word GNU, you can spell it G-N-U and you've got a joke. Perhaps not a very good joke. <laughs> there are lots of them. So we've learned to associate that word with humor. So, given a specific meaningful reason to use it as the name of a programming project, I couldn't resist. But when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. Because if you say the new operating system, you're already mistaken. We've been working on it since 1984 and using a variant of it since 1992. So it's not new anymore, <coughs> but it still is GNU, and it will always be GNU. So please be careful and pronounce it GNU. There is a com another common pronunciation error that you need to avoid, which sounds like Linux. It's amazing, but most people, when they talk about the GNU system, pronounce it Linux. <laughs> <laughs> How did this error get started? Well, the confusion happened in 1992. By that point, we've been working on the GNU system for about eight years. And we had almost all of the initial system, but one major essential component was still missing. That was the kernel. The kernel is the component in an operating system that allocates the machine's resources to all the other programs you run. When we were working on a kernel, we started in 1990. But I think I made the project too ambitious by choosing a very advanced and elegant design, which I hope would advance the state of the art. Uh, but it took many years to get that kernel to run at all. It, essentially, it was too much of a research project and ran into other practical obstacles along the way. And it's, it works, but it doesn't work all that well. It needs a lot more work. Fortunately, we didn't have to wait for it because in 1992, Mr. Thorvalds, who had a proprietary kernel called Linux, freed it. He released it under the GNU General Public License, which was one of several free software licenses that people used back then. That's the license that I wrote in order to use it to release the new components. But I wrote it in such a way <coughs> that anybody could use it to release his programs. And that's what Torvalds did. Linux was started in 1991, but during 1991 it was released as non-free software. It's like it had a different license that was too restrictive to qualify as free software. But in 92 he freed it, and
What's really bad about that is what it threatens to do to you. Because freedom is frequently threatened. To keep it, you have to defend it. To defend it, you have to value it. Or why would you bother? And to value freedom, you have to first understand the idea of freedom and believe you should have it. So, <clears throat> computing is a rather new area of life. It's less than 20 years, even in the most advanced countries, that most people have been using computing. That's not a lot of time to spread the idea that people deserve freedom in their computing. And if people don't have that idea, then they won't join our fight, and we could lose because of that. So that's what we need to achieve. Our, our main mission, actually, is to teach people that they should have freedom. <clears throat> and how can we do that? Well, we've done a lot of work already. When, we, when people see the work we've done, we hope that they will see why we did it and think about it, and think about the issue of freedom, and then some of them will come to conclude that they should have freedom, and then they'll f join our fight, and that way we will be more numerous and we might win. But the problem is, when we try to start a debate about what freedoms users should have in using a program, when we try to bring our ideas to the attention of the public, or even the users of the GNU system, we run into two obstacles. First of all, most of them don't know it's the GNU system. They think it's Linux. They think it was started by Mr. Torvalds in 1991, and they think it comes out of his vision of life. So they admire him tremendously for what they think he did, and they study his vision of life, and they follow his views, and they don't even consider ours. And that means they don't learn to value their own freedom, and they're not going to fight. We could lose, all of us could lose our freedom, because they didn't join in. So we tell people, <clears throat> we publish articles explaining the philosophy behind GNU, the philosophy of free software. But a lot of people look at that and they say, why should I read that? That's the philosophy of those GNU extremists. I'm a Linux user, they say to themselves. So I admire the pragmatic views of Mr. Torvalds. I won't read that. Now, pragmatic tends to mean taking important long-term decisions based on short-term convenience, which is not wise way to choose them. But in any case, this is what they say. How ironic. Because in fact, they're using the GNU system. They just don't know it. If they knew that they're in fact GNU plus Linux users, they might tell themselves something different. Like, I'm a GNU slash Linux user, and here's the philosophy of the GNU project that developed the biggest piece of the system I'm using, I'd better pay attention and think about what they say, and then we have a chance to convince them that they deserve freedom, and then they might join in the fight and we might win. So it's important for all of you to make us succeed. Therefore, please make an effort to always call the system GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux. Please don't call the system just Linux. That's not right, but it's also, it also leads down the wrong path. Now, you can't tell people the history of the system in one second by saying GNU slash. But what you can do is show them in advance the reasons why they should pay attention to what we have to say. What we have to say is what you're hearing now. And if these people know that the system they're using is the GNU system, they'll see a reason to pay attention to what we say. 
and we might convince them. At least we'll have a chance to try. But there's another obstacle we encounter nowadays when we try to spread the ideas of free software. And that is, lots of people don't call it free software. They say open source. Why is that? Well, during the 90s, as the GNU plus Linux system spread, a lot of people noticed it had practical advantages too. And they recommended it to their friends for these practical reasons, but without talking about freedom. So, there were two political camps within the free software community. There was the free software movement, we who said this is a matter of freedom, join us and fight for freedom. Replacing these non-free programs is part of how we fight for freedom. And then there was the, the then there were the, the other people, people like Mr. Torvalds who rejected our ethical approach to the issue. But they liked free software, so they contributed and, and used it and promoted it for other reasons. And there was a debate between these two camps, so people entering the community could see that there was a free software movement and, the, and, and what we stand for. But in 1998, the people in the other camp coined the term open source so that they could avoid saying free. And they also wanted to avoid raising ethical issues. They didn't want to present this in ethical terms. And above all, they didn't want to say that some widely used business model was wrong because that was too shocking, too radical for them. So having a new term, they had the chance to decide what ideas to associate with it and what ideas to leave out. They chose to leave out the entire ethical level of the issue. So they don't say that any of the usual business practices are wrong. They don't, we say if you develop a program and you distribute it to other people, you must respect their freedom. You must make it free software. Otherwise it's wrong. They won't say that. Instead, they say if you distribute a program, make a program and distribute it to others, it's in your practical interest to let them change and redistribute the program because they'll improve the code quality. So you can see the fundamental difference between these ideas. They're based on different values. For us, the values are freedom and community. For them, the values are uh, code quality. For us, ethical values, for them, only practical convenience values. Well, they were the majority, and most of the, in 1998, when they coined this term, and most of the companies joined them, and the politicians and journalists mostly followed them. So until that time, as our software spread, it spread with the term free software, and so to some extent gave people a chance to find out about our ideas. But nowadays, since 1998, that's not so. Because most people hear the, our software associated with the term open source, and only with the ideas of open source. Since then, we have to work to spread our ideas, even to the people using our software. so soon. <laughs> I hope it wasn't something I said. <laughs> That's why since 98, my main work has been spreading the ideas of free software, not uh, 